Hello, my name is Abe Clancy, and this video is my take on tips and advice for people playing Enter the Gungeon. I'll keep this introduction short, but a couple of things to keep in mind. This information may be slightly out of date. In particular, Advanced Gungeons and Dragons, an update, is being released at some point in the near future, and the current Switch version of the game has several altered mechanics related to this future update. There will be spoilers in this video. It really can't be helped, and you will not be getting any further warnings. And there's a table of contents in the video description, so feel free to jump around in the video. Dodge Roll Games The story goes that they named their studio after the dodge roll mechanic from Dark Souls, so I am pretty sure that this is going to be an important mechanic in Enter the Gungeon. But you will not always need to dodge roll in order to avoid damage. Some attacks in Gungeon can be avoided very simply, by not dodging and instead by just moving very slightly. That may seem obvious, but thinking of this as a separate maneuver from dodging can help to separate them in your mind and help you to more clearly identify when you should dodge and when you should weave. And you're going to be doing a lot of weaving in Gungeon. Blue shotgunners, as long as you are far enough away from them, they don't need to be dodged. This attack on the Bullet King fight, just weave back and forth through the gaps and make a single dodge at the end. Same thing on the Gorgon fight. Learn the attacks from enemies and bosses and learn to identify when you should make a dodge and when you should just weave instead. Flipping tables is another defensive option at the player's disposal. Many players ignore tables because they are not guaranteed in every room, and there's only a single boss in the game that can have tables. But there are several aspects of table flipping, besides table techs, that can make them incredibly strong. First, while the gungeon is procedural, the individual rooms are handcrafted and the tables are always in the same locations. So once you find a strategy that works for a room, you can usually repeat it the next time around. Second, tables block bullets in three different ways. They break many bullets in a wide area when flipped, they act as a temporary wall, and then they again break many bullets in a wide area when destroyed. On rooms with many tables, this can provide you with a ton of protection. Third, flip tables break line of sight, so certain enemies will not fire at the player if they are hiding like a coward. And fourth, possibly the weirdest, best, most unknown feature of tables is that when you flip a table, you are literally invincible for a short period of time. Seriously, check it out here. How the heck am I not taking absurd damage by literally walking into the bullets? Because by flipping a table, I gain a short invincibility. You can easily abuse this by dodging into tables to flip them, which provides you with iframes on the way towards the table, and extra iframes when you land and flip the table. Even contact damage is negated by the table flip. The simplified approach to weapons in Gungeon is that a gun is either a boss killer or a room clearer, and the simplified approach to ammo drops is to use one weapon until it is completely out of ammo before using anything else. While these are good starting strategies, there is much more nuanced weapon selection in Gungeon than that. Some weapons are almost entirely for support. Weapons like the plunger, fossilized gun, or molotov launcher are not intended to be used for an entire room. They are your openers, applying status effects and weakening every enemy in a room so that they are easier to kill with your other weapons. Even the RPG is a great gun, capable of killing enemies in a single shot, but is ideally used as a single shot opener to KO a single enemy before changing to something else. Some weapons can be used for utility purpose in rooms. While your glacier can be used as an excellent boss killer, on difficult rooms, go ahead and expend a few rounds to destroy a cluster of enemies or freeze them. Don't be afraid of using ammo in your better weapons when the situation warrants. My rule of thumb is generally, use whatever weapon you need to use in order to kill enemies and stay safe. Sometimes this means using your stronger weapons, even boss killers, in order to kill tough enemies quickly. Conversely, when most of the enemies are killed, and you're just picking off the stragglers, you can use your starting pistol or your other weaker weapons to conserve ammo in your better weapons. Some weapons are situational. The Devolver is a great gun for dealing with shambling rounds. Charmed Bow on a few enemies in a room can keep aggro off of you. Beam weapons are great for Daisuke's challenge mode. Here's a super tip. Those red mages that take your bullets and use them against you, they can't catch shots from certain weapons like the laser rifle, charge shot, serious cannon, heck blaster, corsair, mine cutter, the piercing form. So even just keeping these weapons on hand for countering these mages is a viable use for them. Most guns in Gungeon have a use. Sometimes you might need an accuracy upgrade to make a weapon hit more accurately, or poison or fire immunity to make a goop-based weapon safe to use, or scattershot 
to give you three times the chances for status effects to apply. Just try to keep your mind open to the possibilities as you play and experiment with other weapons. Be careful about what passives you pick up that might negatively affect your weapons. For example, if you have piercing rounds or angry bullets, explosives will no longer explode on impact and will be much less useful. Damage upgrades only slightly increase your damage with explosives. This is because explosive weapons actually have two forms of damage. Impact damage, which is affected by the upgrades, and explosive damage, which is not affected. If you have significant damage upgrades, your other weapons might be better than explosives. Conversely, damage downgrades are not as detrimental to explosive weapons, so Scattershot or Helix are incredibly strong, as they increase your overall DPS while also providing the additional explosions that will destroy enemy bullets. Scattershot or Helix plus any explosive weapon make a fantastic boss-killing combination. Bosses are guaranteed to give you a gun, if you haven't yet picked up a gun on the floor. This is to ensure that the player is always getting at least one gun per floor. So if you fight the boss before opening up any chests on the floor, you can get two or more guns per floor. As far as I know, just dropping a gun and picking it back up doesn't change this behavior. But running out of ammo with a weapon, throwing it, then picking it up does seem to break this gun guarantee, allowing you a chance to get passive or active items from the boss fight. In general in Gungeon, I find having more guns is more beneficial than having more passives, as good bullet effects or damage upgrades are hard to find, but you can play the way you want to play. Something else to keep in mind is that your weapons will passively reload while you are not using them. This is quite handy for increasing your overall DPS and can be used on boss fights to great effect, especially with freezing or explosive weapons. You could pop off a few freezing shots when you want the boss to slow down for a bit, or you could switch over to an RPG to break some bullets quickly, then switch back and wait for the RPG to reload passively. Just keep in mind that this passive reloading takes about twice the length of a regular reload, so the RPG with its 3 second standard reload time will take about 6 seconds to passively reload in your pocket. Speaking of ammo conservation, every ammo drop that appears in your run has to be picked up, otherwise the rat will take it. But you can scare the rat away from your ammo drops temporarily. Just teleport away, then come back. The rat will get scared and flee, which buys you travel to any adjacent room. Check out the minimap, go to any adjacent room, and fight the enemies with the weapon you will be taking the ammo drop for. When you get back, the ammo will still be there. You can go to every connected room on the minimap, and as long as you stay within one room of the ammo drop, the rat won't take it. So go, fight, kill, look for secret rooms, and when you are done, pick up the ammo drop. And keep in mind that it's not always the best idea to take ammo for an empty weapon. Take into account the ammo efficiency of your weapons and your specific needs. A half-empty Mega Hand or Heroin is still an efficient use for an ammo drop. Or if you don't have many boss-killing guns, refilling a half-empty Commando or Glacier could be the best use. In AG&D, you won't necessarily need to use one weapon all the time until it runs out of ammo. There will be another type of ammo drop that partially refills all of your weapons. This will encourage you to use the right weapon for the right situation. Daisuke's Challenge Mode is certainly a challenge, an unfair challenge that is incredibly difficult to beat. Nobody likes hammer time or high stress, plus four other modifiers on the Lich 1 fight, or Dragon's Rage for that matter. But there are some tricks and strategies that can help you succeed. The first thing to mention is that there are plenty of anti-synergies in DD20 that you need to be aware of. In particular, Blobulon Rancher and Unfriendly Fire are two of the worst offenders here because they severely limit what other items or guns you can take. Here are some examples. Scattershot is awful without remote bullets, because being less accurate means that you will spawn more blobs and hit yourself more often. Backup gun with unfriendly fire will cause you to hurt yourself incredibly often and summon blobs behind you. Even hip holster can cause you to reload unexpectedly and, yes, again, hurt yourself or summon blobs. Crown of guns, d-pad, face melter, similarly, although on the 4th and 5th floor boss fights, these are good weapons to use. 
The shop grub isn't very good due to its high spread. Eye patch has always been pretty terrible and is even worse in DD20. Angry bullets will cause your shots to bounce off enemies, hit walls, then bounce back into you via unfriendly fire. And then you have gun cue, making defensive reload weapons worse, since when you reload, your weapon changes. One-shot weapons like the Scrambler could cause you to light yourself on fire constantly with thermal clips. But it's not all bad. Certain other items and weapons in the game are considerably more valuable due to the nature of DD20. For example, any sort of poison or fire immunity is incredibly valuable for completely counteracting poison pursuit or thermal clips. This includes flying, or items like the sponge. If you have the hazmat suit or you're playing the robot, you have electrical immunity and are immune to the shockwave's laser beam. Another funny synergy if you have electrical immunity is that battery bullets electrifies your shots and therefore makes you immune to your own shots via unfriendly fire. This actually makes the robot quite good at DD20 since you'll never hit yourself with unfriendly fire and weapons like super meat gun and buzz kill are more viable. Accuracy upgrades are another big benefit and make shotguns more viable. Damage over time weapons like plunger and fossilized gun are great since you can let enemies die over time while you focus on dodging. Same with familiars like Super Space Turtle, R2-G2, Sir Junkin, and the Payday characters. Table Tech Blank and Stun are insanely valuable for room clearing, even if they are not useful for the boss fights. Beam weapons are also incredibly valuable in DD20, with even the Mega Dowser being a great pickup if you can get your hands on it. They are very good at destroying cursed ceramics or pot shots quickly, the knockback is great at keeping enemies at bay, such as when you need time to finish a zone control without being surrounded. And Gun Q, Thermal Clips, Unfriendly Fire, and Blobulon Rancher don't really affect beams, making them super useful to have if those modifiers are present. The dragon also has a nastier skull attack, so a beam weapon is insanely valuable on every run, even if just for this one purpose. Now, gun Q can be quite annoying, but you can plan for it. A good strategy is to just have your guns in a particular order before every combat. Just drop all of your weapons and pick them up in the order you want to have them for gun Q. Putting a beam weapon in your number two slot can be nice, so you have a consistent gun Q backup weapon for the room. Ideally, you just want your first few weapons to be whatever is best for clearing rooms. And I don't just mean Mega Hand or Heroin, Shotgun, Heck Blaster, Pulse Cannon, Laser Rifle, and of course, Demon Head, or the Science Cannon. Remember how you can scare the rat off of ammo drops and move one adjacent room without him returning? You can use the same principle here to temporarily store bad boss killing guns in the boss foyer room. It can be smart as a way of preparing yourself for gun cue or thermal clips to play the odds in order to give yourself a better chance of success. Just remember that for each weapon you drop in the boss for your room, you have to scare the rat once per weapon. Often in DD20, the bosses are the most difficult parts of the run. A bad set of modifiers plus a long combat means that you could die in a war of attrition, or just from a high stress, hammer time, gulls revenge, shockwave situation. This is why it is incredibly important to save your blanks for the boss fights not only for the flawless possibility, but for survival's sake. So if you are in room-to-room -room combat on a floor, and you think you're gonna take damage, just take the damage. Save those blanks for the high stress rooms and for the boss fights. Even an item like Full Metal Jacket can be extremely detrimental on a floor as it can waste your blanks before a high stress boss fight. Later bosses will have more modifiers. Chamber 1 bosses will have one or two modifiers with double DD20 active, while the Lich 1 and 2 fights can have up to five modifiers each. But the Chamber 4 bosses and the Dragon all have unique modifiers, so you know exactly what to expect on these boss fights. Let's start with the Kill Pillars. The unique modifier for this fight, Extremely Bad Chess, causes an alternating checkerboard pattern of poison to appear on the floor. This usually isn't too bad to deal with as long as you just move between the safe zones or dodge corner to corner. But if you have any form of poison immunity, then the unique modifier is completely negated and it's just a normal Kill Pillars fight. High Priest has the Something Wicked modifier that makes the candles in the arena spill fire when shot. 
Considering that this fight usually doesn't require you to move around too much, it's not a terribly bad modifier to have. Or, again, if you have any form of fire immunity, then it's just a regular High Priest fight, as the modifier is completely negated. Now, the Wallmonger's unique modifier is more unique than the previous two, and I think much more difficult. This boss requires tough dodging and weaving normally, but with the Knight's Watch modifier, two snipers will stand on top of the wall and will shoot at you constantly. If you have no way of dealing with these snipers, then you'll likely need many blanks in order to flawless this boss. But just like the previous fourth chamber bosses, there are tricks to deal with this modifier. For example, if you have the big boy, all you need to do is use it once, and the snipers on top of the wall will be killed due to the special nature of the big boy's AoE damage. The black hole gun, despite what you may think, does not work at killing the snipers. They are immune to its damage, but they will still get pulled off of the wall. Whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing, though, is situational. The dragon is the last boss with unique challenge modifiers. It always contains high stress and dragon's rage. This modifier makes the dragon have more difficult attacks, including faster firing shots, more skulls, making a beam even more important to have here, and the dragon's breath attack will now bounce off the back wall. The dragon's heart phase is also much more difficult due to faster moving bullets. You won't have the time to make the same types of dodges you would normally make here. You have to be more aggressive with your dodges. In particular, this dodge in a standard dragon fight is made diagonally up and to the side. In DD20, you can't do that. You have to dodge straight to one side in order to have enough time to make consecutive dodges. The bullets are faster, and you will have to angle your dodges differently. Since killing a boss flawlessly in Gungeon provides you with a permanent HP upgrade, you're going to want to expend your resources into killing bosses. Blanks, explosives, freezing weapons, high damage weapons, active items, whatever you have. Freezing weapons work well against most bosses, excluding the Kill Pillars, Dragon, and the Lich, who are all unaffected. Against every other boss, a freezing weapon will slow down their attack and movement patterns, allowing you to dodge more easily. Explosive weapons are also great against most bosses. Explosives tend to do good damage, and they destroy bullets on impact, allowing you to completely neuter some boss attacks and you will probably want to save your high damage weapons for the boss fights, so you have the best chance of obtaining an extra flawless. Sure, you can use the Cobalt Hammer as a room clearer, but at 26 damage per shot, you can output a ton of damage quickly against any boss. But outside of boss rush, all bosses in Gungeon have a damage cap. Boss armor, damage threshold, DPS cap, whatever you want to call it, this prevents bosses from taking large amounts of damage quickly. For example, Against the Bullet King's 950 HP, the Alien Engine's 160 damage per second should kill him quickly, but thanks to a damage cap of 25 DPS, after the initial damage burst, the Alien Engine quickly loses effectiveness. Items like Potion of Gun Friendship, which greatly increase your rate of fire, can end up wasting ammo on bosses. Be wary of your ammo usage and try to deal just enough damage to always be at the cap. Of course, a couple of weapons in the game, namely the Yari Launcher and the Makeshift Cannon, bypass the damage cap, so just use those as quickly as you can. Now, for the rest of this section, I'm just going to go through each boss in the game and try to come up with advice for each one. Alternatively, if you just want to watch me go through Boss Rush and kill each boss, there's a link for that in the video description. This jerk is immune to the Convict's Molotov, as well as any other goop-based weapons, but his Chancellor isn't. So if you have anything that poisons, lights enemies on fire, or creates electricity, hit the Chancellor with it as soon as you can. Otherwise, he can be a bit of a pain to deal with. But the Bullet King himself is a rather straightforward first floor boss. Freezing or explosive weapons counter him nicely, keep your distance, and keep running in circles when you can. He's quite slow. The Bullet King has attacks that you weave through, attacks that you dodge through, and attacks that you weave and dodge through. Don't stay too close, or else he can easily hit you with his 3x2 burst attack, and avoid any fire caused by his chalice. The biggest annoyance in this fight is when he launches the big bullet ball out of the top of his chair. 
Not only is it a tricky attack to avoid, but he can quickly combo into another attack while it's still in the air. Use your blanks during this attack if you need to. It's probably his most difficult attack to avoid. A couple of final tips. If you have the Casey, you can kill the Bullet King instantly by hitting the Chancellor into the King. I don't know if this mechanic will be changed in AG and D, but it works for now. And if you ever enter the boss room from the top, you know that you are not going to be fighting the Bullet King because that's where he stands in the room. What's better than one boss? Two at the same time! This is a good fight to use your support weapons on, whether it's fossilized gun, molotovs, napalm, strike, plunger, anything that can apply DOTs to both bosses at the same time. Especially when they summon extra bulletkins, since a quick spin with the plunger will knock them out after a few seconds and damage the bosses at the same time. You'll want to focus on killing one twin at a time, since as soon as you kill one, the other will heal some of its HP if it's wounded. It also helps to simplify the fight as soon as possible, as two bosses combining attacks can make it tricky to avoid some damage. Especially if the twins surround you, and the game's camera doesn't exactly show you what they are both doing at the same time. Most of the twins' attacks are pretty easy to dodge. Keep your distance, run around them, etc. But there are a couple attacks worth pointing out. One is a 3x3 shot attack where the shots are fired in such a way as to try and surround you. Generally, you just want to weave through this without dodging, as the gaps between the bullets are quite large. The other attack worth mentioning is only used after you've already killed one of the twins. The survivor will fire three blasts at you, the first two you can weave through, but the third usually requires a fine dodge. Just keep running, and time that last dodge to the side. Don't dodge inwards or else you might dodge roll directly into the surviving twin. Technically, during this fight, you can kill both twins at the same time without one of them healing and becoming enraged, but it is quite difficult to pull off. Piercing weapons certainly help, but unless you have a specific strategy in mind, I would recommend just ignoring this and killing them normally one at a time. Gatling Gull can be either the easiest first floor boss fight or one of the hardest, and this difference is almost entirely out of the player's hands. Unlike every other boss in the game, this bird has at least four different types of arenas in which you can fight it. It's RNG as to whether or not you'll have an easy flawless. The simplest boss battle room is the one filled with bushes. They simply take up space and block bullets until you or the gull destroys them. Take advantage of this by running around the gull to get good positioning, and once all the shrubs are destroyed, it's just you versus the original white meat. A slightly more annoying room is the one with chandeliers and tables. The tables are a benefit as they destroy bullets when flipped and act as temporary pillars to stand behind, but the chandeliers can easily fall on your head and explode if you are not paying attention, and you may even want to consider purposefully knocking them down just to make sure that they can't hurt you. The easy mode Gatling Gull fight is on either of the two library rooms that feature large permanent pillars. You can just walk around the pillar running away from the boss like the chicken you are, and not really put yourself in any danger. You just have to be prepared to move quickly if the gull jumps into the air suddenly, as the boss will notice you cheesing the pillars and will attempt to close the distance quickly to surprise you and get in a cheap shot. The hard mode gull fight is on one particular room that has two moats running through it. If the gull is in the middle section, your best bet is to stay put and try to circle around him as quickly as possible. But if the gull is on a side section, you can usually stay in the middle and keep your distance enough that you can weave through his bullets. So generally, the middle area is where you want to be standing. There is a trick to this room if the gull is on one of the sides. If you keep walking towards and away from the gull, he may continuously spin up and then stop firing his Gatling gun. You can sometimes abuse this to keep him from firing too often, while you keep dumping ammo into him. Regardless of which boss arena you get, if Gatling Gull is standing still and firing, you should stand still yourself and just weave through his bullets. If the Gull is walking towards you and firing, you should run away and circle him. And if the Gull fires a single large bullet towards you, prepare for it to break and explode into a wave of bullets. Shrubs, tables, pillars, a good dodge, or blank is usually required when that shot comes in. Meduzi, the Gorgon. Probably the easiest second floor boss, though every time I say that I get hit, so what do I know? The Gorgon has very simple attacks, and doesn't really combo anything. 
weave this one, weave or dodge this one, depending on how the bullet spread looks, and when this attack starts, get in close and run into the large gaps between the bullets. That's about it, really. The arena is always covered in water, and many items like the Molotov don't work at all here. But for some reason, some weapons like the Molotov Launcher and the Napalm Strike do. So go ahead and try out some combinations to see what works and what doesn't. The Beholster can be a difficult boss fight, but it is also a rather cool boss to fight. It's the only boss in the game to get a different attack when it's jammed. And the Beholster is always holding four guns in its tentacles. They are the Commando, the Void Marshal, the M1911, and the Eye of the Beholster, and each gun represents a different attack from the boss during the fight. You will occasionally be shot at by homing missiles from the Commando, quick laser bolts from the Void Marshal, and the Eye of the Beholster is responsible for spawning the beady minions that will shoot you. This is a fight in which dodge rolling should be used very sparingly. While the Beholster fires lots of bullets, there are many large gaps between them to weave through. You just need to react quickly to the fast firing shots, keep moving, and kill the BDs that spawn as quickly as possible. Whenever the Beholster moves towards you, find a good time to move to the other side of the arena to keep your distance. Usually this is when the Beholster starts firing its eye beam at you, as he will not fire any other bullets during this attack. The missiles that are fired against you are annoying and can take two hits to knock out, depending on the weapon that you use. Shotguns or weapons with a fast rate of fire are very good at taking out the missiles quickly, while a pox cannon shot or RPG will simply bounce off and require a follow-up shot to take out a single missile. Weapon selection actually does matter here. Alternatively, any beam weapon will instantly destroy the missiles, even if it is the lowly Mega Dowser. So use those beams! The Amoconda, probably the hardest second floor boss. But why do people hate this boss so much and why is it so difficult? In short, randomness. The movement and bullet patterns fired from the Amoconda all have some measure of randomness, and as a result there are no easy dodges to make. No circular wave of bullets that are a simple series of dodges. No easy weaving around large identical bullet patterns. Every dodge and weave you make must be determined quickly in the moment, and as a result every Amoconda fight feels different. You have snaky bullets that slither back and forth. Angled bullets that travel in a straight line then swerve 90 degrees. Multiple bullet explosions that come out at all angles from the segments of the Amoconda. And of course the turrets that you should kill ASAP before they buff the Amoconda's speed, health, and attacks. Just keep your distance, keep moving, and do your best. The randomness means that specific advice isn't as helpful as you would like it to be. Explosives are nice, but don't really counter the Amoconda, since the bullets are fired from the snake's spread out segments and freezing weapons aren't terribly good since you need to hit the head in order to apply the freeze. But here's a tip to make the fight easier, even if it is rare to put into practice. Normally, extremely high DPS is pointless for a boss fight because all bosses have a damage cap. But the individual segments that form the Amoconda are not affected by the cap. So if you have a super high damage piercing attack, something like Potion of Gun Friendship and Cobalt Hammer, you can destroy the individual Amoconda segments. Destroy enough of them, and the Amoconda won't even be able to shoot. It's a pretty rare thing to be able to do, and you need certain weapons to make this work, but if you can pull it off, you can destroy the Amoconda. The Treadnought. The real key to this fight are all the pillars in the arena. They are temporary, and will be blown up one at a time, but you should be able to use them for protection for long enough to get the Flawless. The tank will cut corners and try to catch you, but just keep your distance, circle the outside of the arena, kill spawned minions, and it should be destroyed in no time. Explosive weapons are nice for breaking the variety of tank shells that are fired at you, including the bullet mines that act as turrets. Freezing weapons work decently enough, but be careful you don't change the rhythm of the fight too much. You generally want the treadnought chasing you down as you run around the arena, so you can keep moving behind pillars and kill spawned minions but if you slow down the tank enough, you might accidentally force yourself into a tricky dodge. Don't stand still, and don't stand next to any walls. The Treadnought can fire high-velocity explosive rounds that are tough to dodge quickly and will hurt you if they explode on the walls next to you. The tank never truly leads its target, so keep moving in a circular pattern and you should never get hit by any shells. But be especially careful with Guan Stones, as they might trigger the explosive round prematurely, causing it to explode in your face. 
Cannon Balrog. An open arena, standard bullet heli attacks, with no terribly difficult patterns. Most of the advice from previous bosses can just be reused here. If you're at range, just weave through the bullets when you can. Dodges are mostly unnecessary when the boss isn't moving. When he bounces around, just dodge and shoot. And explosives and freezing weapons are good to use. But there are a few dangerous moments during this fight, and they are specific enough that I can point them out and offer advice. Cannon Balrog's opening move for the fight can be to move close to you while firing bullets from his eyes. You can easily get cornered with your back up against the wall, which is a bad place to be starting any boss fight. You have a couple of options depending on which specific attack Cannon Balrog does. If the bullet spread is two rotating bullet beams, then you can usually safely weave through them while dodging occasionally when the beams line up. If the bullet spread is random, you'll need to keep retreating from the boss while you weave and try to circle around at a distance. Try to keep the boss as close to the center of the arena as possible, otherwise you'll probably have to expend a blank to avoid potential damage as he closes in. With enough space, you will also avoid the second potentially dangerous move from the Cannon Balrog, him starting his rolling attack. The reason why this can be dangerous is not the bullets, it's that when he starts up he can roll in basically any direction, and if you're close and diagonal to him, he could roll directly into you. If your timing is right, you can dodge roll to give yourself iframes to avoid the contact damage from the Cannon Balrog, so keep that in mind if he starts rolling right next to you. The Supply Drop Special The Mind Flayer can be, in my opinion, the most difficult third floor boss, but this is also the boss with the most tricks to fighting it. I like to stand directly above or below the Mind Flayer, with nearly no exceptions, except when dodging the Claymores. Just hug the wall, and the one attack with alternating left-right circles of bullets coming from the bell is easy to dodge since you're in a blind spot. The Mind Flayer has two other attacks that are easily weavable, one with bullets that come in fast, and one with bullets that bounce off the wall. If the Mind Flayer hides under the bells, any explosive weapon you have, even the RPG, is absolutely the weapon of choice. Even C4 potentially has a use here. By using explosives to kill the bells, the bullets they spawn will break immediately and you can often get through this phase in a single shot. If the Mind Flayer spawns claymores, you have a couple of options. First of all, you could use a blank to stop some of the claymores from spawning. This can give you enough free space to more easily move around and dodge everything. You could use a fast-firing explosive weapon to do something similar but on a smaller scale. Decoys and the charm horn can also be used to prevent the claymores from exploding. They won't perceive you as a threat even if you're inside of their activation range. Electricity or fire damage can kill the claymores. The iBomb companion app can be used to detonate them manually. Or you can always just dodge roll through the claymore explosions if you have nothing else to counter that phase. Four pillars for the Gungeon gods in their halls of stone. One Gungeoneer to tame them all. First of all, against the kill pillars, explosive or piercing weapons are ideal. Piercing lets you hit multiple pillars at the same time, while explosives are very good at destroying their bullets, keeping you safe, and doing extra AoE damage. Freezing weapons don't work at all. As for their attacks, kill pillars always open the fight with the exact same attack. They will all jump into the center of the arena and fire out four lines of bullets that will spin and create a circular arena that you're going to have to dodge through. But there are several strategies for dealing with this attack. If you have explosives or any on-reload bullet-destroying weapons like the Huntsman, what you can do is destroy one line of bullets when they come out of the kill pillars. If done correctly, one corner of the arena will be safe to stand in, and you will only have to dodge an occasional bullet wave coming out of the pillars. This makes this phase much easier to deal with. A slightly more costly method of neutering this attack is to just use a blank before they actually fire their bullet lines. If done correctly, they will not break out of their attack, but the blank will still destroy all of the bullets in the arena, and you will only have to dodge an occasional bullet wave coming from the center. Timing is important here. If you blank after the kill pillars start their attack, it's almost a waste of a blank as the kill pillars will immediately start their next attack. Their other attacks are pretty generic. They will bounce around and fire bullets. Just stay away from them, don't dodge when necessary, and just weave your way through their attacks. 
They do have one really annoying attack where the pillars will come together and bounce towards you, firing bullets as they go. This is where most people take damage. You really do need to run as quickly as possible, keep moving away from the pillars, and use a blank if you need to in order to destroy their bullets. Don't get cornered, don't run into a wall, just keep running in a circle around the arena for as long as you can to avoid them. And if you can, bring them to the top of the arena during this attack. They will have a harder time stomping on you, and you should have slightly more time to dodge their bullets. Also, don't stay on the left side of the arena if possible. The kill pillars have one attack where they will position themselves all along the left wall. You want to be on their right so you don't get squashed. You can easily weave through their shots, but at least you won't take contact damage as long as you stay to their right. When there is only one pillar remaining, the fight gets infinitely easier. Just shoot, move to the side of the incoming bullet, dodge inwards, shoot, move, dodge, shoot, move, dodge, until it's dead. There is no variance in this attack phase, it's just the same dodge over and over again. Technically you can skip this last phase of the fight by killing the last two pillars at the same time, but this is difficult to do. And really you're just skipping the easiest phase of the fight, so it's not really even worth the effort to pull it off. But with certain weapon combinations, it's easy and extremely satisfying. The single most annoying thing about the High Priest boss fight is that random bullets come out of the walls. The second most annoying thing is that these bullets don't travel in a straight line. They curve back and forth. But for the most part, you can avoid these bullets by keeping your back to a wall. They tend to not come out of the walls that you are next to. While the High Priest is visible, just do what you can. Some of his attacks are made for weaving, and some of his attacks are made for dodging. The trickiest standard attack is when the High Priest moves towards you slowly while firing bullets in random directions. Keep your distance and try not to get backed up into a corner as you weave your way out of his attack. When the High Priest starts summoning skulls, you're going to want to use a weapon with a high rate of fire or piercing, like the Gun Zhang, in order to destroy as many of the skulls as possible or you're just gonna want to use a beam weapon. Beams are nice here as they destroy the skulls instantly with just a couple of quick swipes. When the High Priest disappears and summons bullet explosions, hug a wall. Weave through the waves of bullets and dodge only when necessary. Keep in mind that you can always dodge into the wall or at an angle to more accurately control your movement. The trick here is to dodge when two of the waves intersect. As one of the most unique bosses in Gungeon, the Wallmonger is the only enemy in the game that has a literal one-hit KO. If you don't kill the boss fast enough, it will literally crush you into the back wall and kill you. But don't worry too much about it. As long as you are constantly firing, you should be able to kill it with time to spare. Fire immunity is very nice for this fight. As with it, you can stand in the center of the arena when the Wallmonger vomits up flaming goop at you. Otherwise, you can either dodge forward through the wall of bullets, or to the side through the fire. If you're dodging to the side, let yourself catch on fire for a split second before you dodge roll. Timed correctly, you should come out of your dodge roll clear of the fire. And while freezing effects are very nice to have against the wallmonger in general, be very careful using freezing weapons during this attack phase, with the fire on the ground. If the boss is slowed, you can't dodge forward through the bullet wall because their spacing will be slightly increased you will have to dodge to the sides instead. The only attack you really have to dodge is the thin bullet line that is occasionally fired at you. Otherwise, it's just complex weaving of many bullets. Quite complex, actually. This is some of the most difficult weaving patterns in the game. But unfortunately, there is no trick to this. Just practice. Though if you have freezing or explosive weapons, these are very strong to use during these weavable attacks, even if it's just an occasional RPG shot. There is a cheesy way in which you can kill the wallmonger while staying perfectly safe from all damage during the fight. You just need a particular item set, like the bloodied scarf plus a potion of lead skin, or more ideally, just the ring of ethereal form. If you can somehow get behind the wallmonger, such as by using the ring when the wallmonger is starting his downward movements, you can get stuck behind the wall and can be safe from literally all of his bullets except for Snipers in DD20 or the Lord of the Jammed. It's rare to make this work, and you have to wait for the Wallmonger to be moving, because you can't move beyond the range of the game's camera, but if you can get it to work, you can kill the Wallmonger flawlessly very easily. 
The dragon is a hard fight, and it has so much dang HP to work through, but some of its attacks are dirt simple. Sweeping two Uzis in front of it, dodge. Holding Uzis and firing bullet spreads, weave. Firing a rocket, dodge. The other attacks require a little bit more finesse. When the dragon starts firing bouncing bullets at you, the way I see it is you have three options. You can look ahead and try to find the safe places to stand. You can stand in the corner and dodge in place. As long as your timing is correct, you should be perfectly safe here. Or you can stand in the middle of the lower wall and try to weave or dodge in place to avoid the shots coming at you. When the dragon throws SMG knives against the walls, you're going to want to knock these out as quickly as possible, using your best weapons or active items to help. Stand below the knives, and the closest one won't be able to hit you at that particular angle. You can stop the dragon from creating the knives in the first place by blanking just as they are thrown. If timed correctly, both knives will be blanked out of the air, and you will have effectively used a blank to counter this dragon attack. When the dragon flaps its wings and sends bullets down the sides of the arena and through the middle, there is a relatively safe spot to stand, the corner. Either corner will work, the bullets that come down your side will curve just before reaching you, so you're safe from at least half of the bullets in the attack. Then just do some in-place dodging against the wall, and you have a high chance of easily avoiding damage. As an additional tip, you might want to enable Tiny UI in the Options menu to make it easier to see yourself here. When the dragon breathes his fire bullets at you, his head will turn to follow your movement across the arena. Ideally, if you start this attack phase while standing near one corner, you can tiptoe across the arena to the opposite corner with just enough time for his attack to be over. You could, however, also use a decoy to take the aggro from the dragon during the attack. If you're in a pinch, you can look for an opening to move across his bullet wave. So in general, you want to stand near the corners of the arena at most times. Weave around bullets from his other attacks, but as soon as the bullets pass, get back into the corner in preparation for his next attacks. And when the dragon fires those skulls at you, just like the High Priest fight, the ideal weapon is a beam since it will destroy the skulls instantly, but anything with a high rate of fire or multiple shots works nicely against these skulls. Even a sawed-off shotgun can protect you here. You will know that this attack is coming because the dragon's teeth will glow. During the dragon's heart phase, you'll want to dodge between the safe zones and hit the heart as hard as you can. Technically, it is possible to KO the heart in a single wave, but it requires extremely good timing and high, consistent DPS. The alien engine is my most reliable way of doing it, but I'm pretty sure I've done it with other combinations too. There is one trick that I love doing whenever possible to make this phase super easy. Just run out of ammo with the D-pad and spawn a chest to hide behind. Enemy bullets won't destroy the chest, so you can just hold still and wait for the bullets to pass you by. It is a bit cheesy, but it's not like it happens every run, and I just do it for amusement's sake. One final thing to note about the dragon, Freezing weapons don't work at all, and explosives aren't super useful since there is no single point from which the bullets are spawned. If you've already beaten your past, you should probably save your explosive ammunition for later use. The true final boss of Gungeon. Three phases, difficult attack patterns, a ton of HP. If you can survive through bullet hell to face the Lich, there's always a chance of success. But, a couple of things to note. Freezing weapons do not work against the Lich in any of his three phases, but you can still freeze the minions summoned during the first phase. Explosive weapons are extremely useful during the first phase, and somewhat useful during the second, so go ahead and use everything you've got as soon as you can. The first phase, a balance of weaving and dodging. This attack from the Lich with spinning bullet paths can be weaved easily enough. Try not to dodge. It's pretty unnecessary as long as you are far enough away from the boss. This attack with bouncing bullets is the same. Hug the wall. This way you won't be surprised from bullets hitting you in the back. And just continue to weave. But remember, the bullets with tails are the ones that will bounce. The Lich fires two different high-speed shots. One that is a single bullet and super easy to dodge, and one that is a multi-shot spread. The spread can surround you if you are moving, but if you're standing still when it's fired, you should be able to just sidestep them all. So whenever it looks like the Lich is about to shoot, 
stop moving for a couple of seconds until you can identify which attack is incoming. This attack from the Lich is the hardest from the first phase. You can't just dodge directly into the bullets. They're perfectly spaced, so you will still take damage. But there's a few different ways to safely approach this attack. You can dodge at a hard angle along the bullets. Angle it correctly, and you can easily repeat this dodge through the entire attack. If the Lich isn't too close, you can just stand still and barely squeeze through the gaps between the bullets. You may have to move on occasion to avoid random bullets coming at you, but this works relatively well enough. Another way to handle this attack is to hug the wall and just dodge in place, or at an angle into the wall towards the Lich. Your iframes should protect you while the bullets hit the wall and dissipate. Second phase. This super annoying attack from the Lich looks freaking impossible, but there are actually a couple of different ways to handle it. One way is to do consecutive rectangular movement, following the direction of the bullets. I like a simple down, right, up, left, repeating weave. Alternatively, you can probably dodge directly into the bullets coming at you as long as you start on one side and dodge into the bullets. The four circles attack can be handled simply enough by moving to one side of the arena, then the other with a dodge or two. But if the Lich combos into the previously described attack, you might find yourself in a tricky position as you transition into a different dodging pattern. The many snaking bullet attack is tricky, just keep moving and dodging, though you may wish to use a blank during this attack to keep yourself safe. I'm pretty sure the bullets anticipate your movements, so erratic movement does seem to work rather well at keeping them away from you. When the Lich smacks his hands into the ground, he sends bullets to the back wall and one of the sides. Head in the opposite direction and try to find a gap to weave or dodge through after most of the bullets have disappeared. Third phase. Ideally, stand to the side or below the Lich here, and don't stand at the oblique angles. The Lich has two attacks that launch high-speed bullets in those directions. One is just a spinning attack and is very easy to dodge. Explosives can break open a small hole near the Lich to stand, and Guanstones can easily open up gaps into the arms. The other oblique attack is more annoying, as lines of bullets will come at you from all angles and random bullets will shoot out at you relatively hard to dodge, and often blank-worthy, or at least worthy of any defensive items you have at your disposal. For the boomerang attack, just dodge into it, but be careful of it coming back around and hitting you from behind. You might have to dodge it again on the way in. The Lich moving up and down, spawning bullets to the left and right over and over again? Simple, just dodge through it, or if you can, stand exactly below him and you will avoid taking any damage, and you can just fire up in a straight line. For the rocket ship attack, try not to run away from the Lich too much. He'll make his way towards you, and you want him to stay in the middle of the arena. After a few seconds, get away from him and focus on weaving back through the rocket as it comes in for a second pass. If the Lich fires two rockets, you might want to consider using a blank. Now, The most iconic attack from the Lich is when he moves into the middle of the arena and covers about 90% of the room with bullets. The only safe space is the one surrounding you and it is constantly shifting around. There is a way to make this attack trivial, but requires a spare blank and extremely good timing. If you remember, the kill pillars have a blank sweet spot that you can exploit to counter the first attack from the fight. Just like that, there is a sweet spot on the Lich fight that you can exploit to counter the attack without breaking the Lich out of its attack pattern. Properly timed, you'll get a good 20 seconds to just fire at the Lich without needing to dodge at all. You'll know that this attack is coming because the Lich will move into the center of the arena if he's not already there, and the Lich's arms will get sucked up into his body. Pop your blank, and if done correctly, he will be a sitting duck. To access the secret level, the Oubliette, douse the fireplace in Chamber 1 with a water barrel or any form of goop. Activate the lever inside, and spend two keys opening up the trap door. I stand by the opinion that the Oubliette is one of the most difficult floors of the game. You have few, if any, weapons or items this early in the game, especially since you spent two keys coming down to this floor in the first place, and the enemies you face can be extremely dangerous. In particular, the purple shotgunner Deadeyes, the big mushroom Spogers, and the spinning blob Pupilons. But the boss of the Oubliette, the Blobby Lord, 
is a pushover. Its attacks are straightforward, and most can be dodged or weaved at a distance. The bullet wave is obviously made to be dodged. Just treat it like any other laser attack in the game, like the one from the Beholster. Blob faces are to be weaved while you circle the boss at a distance. Dodging through these can be difficult, since they move very quickly when they are bouncing. When the Blobby Lord moves slowly towards you, firing a random bullet spread, try and keep your distance as you weave through the attack. If you get cornered, you could easily take a hit or be forced to use a blank. Explosives are very good at countering one attack in particular. When the Blobby Lord squashes down and creates four circular rings that expand, Normally you just weave through the gaps, but a single explosion from any weapon will break a section of these bullets so you don't have to dodge a thing. Another attack that is easier with explosives is not exactly an attack. When the Blobby Lord goes into one of the grates, it summons bullet blobs that bounce around. If you can fire an explosive just as this happens, you will destroy a large number of the bullet blobs. If not, you're going to have to be very careful during this attack. Keep your distance, stay next to a wall, and dodge along it. Run to the opposite side of the arena if you can. Finally, there is no flawless for this boss, so don't worry so much if you take a couple of hits during the fight. To access the second secret level, the Abbey, take the old crest from the Oubliette to the pedestal in Chamber 2 the Gungeon proper. Then prepare for a difficult floor full of priests, gun cultists, jammed enemies, and leaden maidens. If the Blobby Lord is one of the easiest bosses, the Old King is one of the hardest. Incredibly tanky, with fast moving bullets and complex attack patterns, and an extremely difficult floor to get through before reaching the main event. Freezing and explosive weapons work well against the Old King, but keep in mind that with his large pool of HP, your freezing weapons will lose their effectiveness eventually, and explosive weapons will not be able to kill the boss on their own. Even still, you should use both on this boss if you have them. Some of the Old King attacks are similar to Bullet King attacks, but all are substantially more difficult. A faster 3x2 burst attack, keep moving, keep your distance, and be prepared to dodge quickly. An expanding ring attack with added jammed bullets. The inner few bullets will curve, so try to take that into account when determining where to dodge through the wave. Skulls that follow you and split. Keep your distance and just sidestep them after they split. A red ring of jammed bullets that track you down. Move around it quickly and it will spin away. Or hug a wall and dodge through it to make the ring destroy itself. The multi-spiral attack from the Old King is theoretically easy to avoid as you just need to stand still and avoid the spiral arms as they surround the boss. But it comes out very quickly and it's tricky to know exactly where you should be standing. Then there's three really nasty attacks that can catch you off guard and are the most likely to hurt you. One is a much more difficult spinner attack that has a faster moving last wave that is trickier to dodge through. Just stay in close while weaving through the spinning and dodge close to the boss. Next is a weird bullet explosion in which alternating layers of bullets will curve in opposite directions. Dodge inwards if you're close to the boss, or if you're at a distance, just wait and weave after the bullets have split. This attack has a relatively low range, so if need be, you can always just back off and wait for it to disappear. And the worst attack that the Old King uses is firing a big bullet ball out of the top of his chair. Just like with the regular Bullet King, this attack can combo into another attack, but due to the enhanced difficulty of this fight, it's even more dangerous to avoid and you really need to take care in weaving through the attack as gracefully as possible. Considering the Old King has such a large pool of HP, you can't be blanking attacks like this every time they come out. Anyways, after all that, that's all I have for right now. I might think of more to talk about after the next Gungeon update is released, so stay tuned for that. And for more Gungeon content, check out the links in the description below. Subscribe on YouTube for Gungeon every day, and follow on Twitch for Gungeon streams. And thank you very much for watching.